Los funcionarios encargados de hacer cumplir la ley son los responsables de poner a los delincuentes entre rejas. Pero, ¿qué ocurre cuando son ellos los condenados a prisión? He aquí cuatro casos diferentes en los que oficiales de policía corruptos fueron condenados ante los tribunales. Se trata del oficial Michael Amiot, de 37 años, del Departamento de Policía de Euclid, quien en 2017 realizó una parada de tráfico a Richard Hubbard tras percatarse de que la matrícula del vehículo estaba registrada a nombre de una persona con el permiso de conducir suspendido. Durante la parada, Amiot alegó que Hubbard se resistió al arresto y procedió a golpearlo repetidamente. Más tarde, en agosto de 2019, Amiot fue arrestado y acusado en el Tribunal Municipal de Euclid después de seguir una extensa investigación. Sin embargo, debido a los trastornos causados por la pandemia de COVID-19, su juicio se pospuso durante dos años, reanudándose finalmente en 2022. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you to the court for allowing me a few minutes to speak. It's been a long road. I was 31 years old at the time of this incident. I'm 37 today. As I get older, I tend to put things in perspective more. We're all molded and shaped by our experiences in life and the outcomes of those experiences. This incident is no different for me, and I learned a lot as I look back. I know I've certainly changed in many ways. I'm far from a perfect person. The one thing I've always done is look back and reflect on my mistakes and failures. It is very important for personal growth. History is a great teacher. The only problem is you can never change it. You can't rewrite it. You can only learn from it. It feels like we've been polarized to feel that people on both sides of this topic are either all good or all bad. But the truth is more nuanced than that. The procedure leading up to this moment has exposed me to what defendants are really up against once they're accused in the system. This case was investigated by numerous outside agencies. With the media attention the case got, it certainly, it certainly should have been. After all, investigations are search for the truth. I want the public to know what really happened to get us to this point. From day one, I cooperated fully with my own department investigation, Iowa County Sheriff's Office Use of Force Investigation Team, and the FBI. I was repeatedly interviewed by numerous investigators in 2017. I never downplayed my actions. These investigations were reviewed by my local department, county sheriff's deputies, federal agents, local prosecutors, county prosecutors, and federal prosecutors. At the conclusion, I was never charged by the city, the state, or the federal government. Two years after this incident, in 2019, the special prosecutor filed charges after negotiating a salary of $250 an hour. Pre-trial stretched on for another three years before trial. During the trial, I was disappointed that the jury didn't get to hear about the findings of those investigations or to hear from a single investigator. I was also disappointed about how known falsehoods were allowed to be presented like the truth. One of the most shocking examples was a prosecution witness called who testified that I was celebrating in the aftermath of this arrest. They testified that I was high-fiving, fist-bumping, dabbing it up with other officers. There was five police cars on East 228th Street that day, all with their dash cameras on and rolling. They all had overlapping fields of view. I can be seen in front of one of those cameras the entire time I was on scene until I was transported to the hospital. Nothing remotely close to what the witness described happened with me or any other officer on the scene. They knew this and put the witness on the stand anyway. This was a use of force encounter that divided a community. It is something I've replayed in my head for the better half of a decade. This is not something I've ever celebrated. I take full responsibility that there was a failure on my behalf to get Mr. Hubbard in custody quickly. The incident was prolonged and I was shot with a taser. During the deployment, I broke my hand, ruptured tendons, and injured my shoulder. When most people see a violent encounter like this, they usually ask, are officers allowed to punch people? And if so, under what circumstances are they allowed to do it? 
for me, it was important to attempt to educate the jury as I was educated as a police officer. I called every relevant instructor I had to the stand, taser instructors I had, department use of force instructors, captain in charge of the use of force committee, my police academy use of force instructors, and traffic stop instructors. I hired a national use of force expert who reviewed everything. Each of them agreed that I acted within the scope of my training. Use of force is supposed to be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer in light of their training and experience. Every officer testified that my response was consistent with the law, policy, and training. We also submitted handbooks, training documents, and videos supporting the testimony. Regardless of how I feel about the situation, I accept the jury's verdict. However, it's become clear that there's a disconnect between how officers are taught to react and how the public expects officers to react. I cannot change the outcome here, but I can make positive changes going forward. I have to figure out how to move forward and make sure I don't end up here again. As a community, we have to figure out how to come back together and make sure we don't end up here again as well. Our law enforcement training must keep officers safe and also be consistent with public policy. A lot of changes have been made since 2017. And if you can give me just another moment, I'm going to talk about a lot of the changes that I've made and the department's made. During the aftermath of this incident, the department started looking at alternative use of force training that does not rely on striking. Several officers were sent to become racy survival tactics instructors. These instructors now teach a revolutionary defensive tactics system based on Gracie Jiu Jitsu. These tactics are more effective at subject control. Instead of, playing pace, instead of pain compliance through strikes, kicks, tasers, etc., it utilizes mechanical control holds and body positioning. I think the leadership of my department would attest to that champion these efforts. Early data from one department utilizing this program regularly shows a 48% decrease in officer injuries and a 53% decrease in suspect injuries based on employment of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in their control division. The department found that uh, physical confrontations with suspects were 200% more likely to be injured by an officer that did not have the same training. They also reported a decrease in taser usage and workers' comp claims by $70,000 per year, which was significantly less than the cost of the program. I'm proud to share this is now part of our Euclid Police Department's annual defense tactics training program. Previously, I had four hours of training every three years. Now the training is completed at least on an annual basis. I've personally taken at least almost 100 hours of training outside the police department and around the state pertaining to use of force and human relations since this incident. The Euclid City Council has provided funding to officers, giving them the option to seek additional training additional use of force training on the officer's own time at a local Gracie Jiu-Jitsu school. The school is owned and operated by another local police officer. I've taken full advantage of this opportunity so far, and out of all the officers participating in the program, I've advanced the furthest and attained the most rank since this training program began. You could receive some grant money through COVID. I worked with a group of officers to get some of that money to build a new use of force training room. We were given approximately $20,000 for materials to price, design, and build a new defensive tactics training area. I helped design the new room. I personally constructed a large 1,120 square foot training mat complete with wall mats and department logos. I put in every screw, nut, and bolt into the new training area myself. We've never had anything like it before. I worked with one of the defensive tactics instructors to create waivers so we can use the new training area in our own time using department techniques to get the repetitions we need to not only be more effective on the streets, but to keep suspects and officers safer during these encounters. I want to end by saying I'm not an advocate for or against use of force. Everything I did on that day was based on my training and experience. From here on out, I'll be an advocate for subject control training department-wide going forward so we can all be at our best when the time comes. I have a deep respect and love for the citizens and this community. I want to do my best to serve them. After all, it's what they deserve. 
Thank you. Thank you. El discurso del oficial Amiot refleja su compromiso de minimizar el uso de la fuerza contra las personas, pero no demuestra ninguna empatía hacia su víctima, Richard Hubert, algo que incluso el juez nota y señala. Officer Amiot, uh, your counsel mentioned rehabilitation. What does that mean to you? Well, rehabilitation is changing the... Stand up. Sorry. Well, rehabilitation be changing behavior, in my mind, in order to not move away from different outcomes. Um, so, like in this case, for example, we got here for, in, I believe, punches in the duration of the fight. If there's a better way or faster way to do it, then the police department's looking at ways to do that. So, a lot of that's being taken for me, training at my own time, and uh, the department's done it. That's rehabilitation to me is. You know, I'm, I'm listening to everything that uh, was said by everyone, and, and particularly what you were saying. One of the things that I did not hear You did not address Mr. Hubbard at all. Uh, and I'm not saying it's something that need to be done, but it's an observation that I made. Uh, and part of that, uh, you know, I, I try to observe and, and see what's going on and listen. And you can be seated. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit here. I just wanted to ask that question. I, you know, I, I do, I didn't just sit here and let the trial pass me by. I, I observed the testimony from everyone and listened. One of, one of the things that... Uh, stood out to me is that uh, the initiation of this incident probably never should have occurred when you receive that initial radio communication. That initiated this whole thing. And the other thing that sort of stood out to me was that in approaching the vehicle and asking Mr. Hubbard to get out of the vehicle, from my perspective, there was no, there was an inability for him to get out of that vehicle without making contact with you. Inability to get out of that vehicle. Um, I, I appreciate the things that you said about mistakes and failures, the, the amount of investigation that's gone on that took place as a result of that and and I I appreciate all of that. You know, I uh, personally spent over 30 years in the military. So I'm used to having orders, following orders, obeying orders, a regimented order of things. I, I'm accustomed to that. And, and I appreciate the necessity of police having the ability to, we need them. We need them to do their job appropriately. Uh, and when we deviate from that, then 
we have to do what we need to do to ensure that uh, it doesn't occur in the future. And I, I appreciate what Euclid has done, the Euclid Police Department has done with respect to modifying how contact is made and how you get people under control. And police need to be able to control a folk. No doubt about that. There must be control. But uh, there's a limit to how that's done. And based upon the evidence that was presented in the testimony, and, and I did listen to your trainers, your prior instructors, I did listen to them, but I, I do believe in this case, I believe the jury got it right. I do. Uh, and the court must impose the sentence that the court feels is appropriate in a case like this. And I appreciate uh, the information provided in the pre-sentence investigation. And generally, uh, I'm the type of person that generally follows recommendations, generally speaking. Uh, I'm not here today to send a, a message to the world. I'm here today to evaluate what occurred here, and especially given the length of time that has expired since this incident and to today take what I think is the appropriate action in imposing a sentence. How long did Mr. Hubbard spend in jail? I think an hour or two. An hour or two. Okay. Okay. Good. That's a good thing. Uh, Mr. Hubbard, let me say to you, uh, it's been seven years. Yes. Uh, the city of Euclid uh, compensated you. Yes. Uh, if you need assistance, you need to go and get that assistance. But uh, I'm not going to say you're not going to have uh, instances of flashback or what have you, but you need to uh, move on with your life also. Oh, yeah, yes, for sure. And not uh, let this incident uh, continue to hover over you. The city compensated you. Council, uh, I appreciate uh, your comments with respect to the things the court is required to take a look at in imposing a sentence. Uh, based upon uh, the evidence presented and the pre-sentence investigation, the court at this time will impose a sentence of uh, 90 days, uh, require you to pay a fine of $1,000, and will require you to pay the court costs. In addition, the court will suspend the sentence of 90 days, uh, place you on non-reporting community control for a period of one year. Uh, if you violate during that one year, then the court will retain the ability to impose the sentence. Anything on behalf of the state? No, Your Honor. On behalf of Ms. Dania. Just what um, count did this assist for electing the sentence? What count? While uh, Mr. Hubbard's rights were violated and the officer, as an officer, he used his authority to do that. However, given the length of time involved here, the court will use the assault as opposed to the violation of civil rights. Not saying they weren't violated, but given the length of time, uh, 
the court will use the assault charge. Anything else? Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. That's all. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm still troubled by the fact that you did not address Mr. Hubbard. I, I can address him. I know, that's all right, Your Honor. No. no. It's not all right. I don't need it. You do need it. Great. You you say you can't move on. I'm telling you, you need to move on. Not easy. Life is not easy. But as long as you let that handicap you, He has control. As long as it handicaps you, he has control. You make that decision, sir. Do you want him controlling or this situation to control you? No. You need to think about that. That's all. Awesome. All right. El jurado condenó a Amiot por un cargo de delito menor de agresión y un cargo de interferencia con los derechos civiles. Como resultado, el agente de policía de Euclid Michael Amiot recibió una condena de un año de control comunitario no vigilado y una multa de mil dólares por la agresión a Richard Hubbard. Inicialmente, el juez visitador Guy Rees también impuso una sentencia de 90 días, pero la sentencia fue suspendida posteriormente. Si crees que el agente Michael Emmett fue poco empático y abusó de su autoridad y poder, espera a conocer el caso del sheriff Charles Reeder. Our debit card was put in a machine and the money was taken from our checking account. Well, obviously, I, that doesn't answer the question, where did the money in the checking account come from? But no, from, I, I, at that time, I was making the salary of the sheriff and my wife was making approximately okay. $2,500. I mean, just, just, just asking the question here, that, that, that's all. Se trata de Charles Reeder, un ex sheriff del condado de Pike que en 2019 fue acusado de robar dinero de las redadas de drogas de su departamento para su adicción al juego. Reader también estuvo en el Centro de Atención Nacional, allá por 2016, por su adicción al juego. En ese momento, Reader había sido parte de un caso en el que ocho miembros de la familia Roden fueron encontrados masacrados en el condado de Pike. Reader afirmó que no podía dormir debido al caso, lo que a su vez le llevó al juego. I stand here before you today to take accountability for the, my actions. As a sheriff of Ohio, I shed, <clears throat> excuse me, I shed bad light on the office of sheriff. I can only ask that my staff, their families, the community, and my family who is here today will forgive me for the undue stress I caused them. For this, I am terribly sorry. <clears throat> I stood in this court on September 24th and pled guilty to the charges against me to accept responsibility for my conduct. That day, within minutes, Everything that I'd worked for professionally and honorably for 25 years was stripped to me with nobody to blame but myself. My staff and I had united with the community and had a partnership and trust. And they truly believed in us as a unit, as a whole. And I betrayed that trust. If I could go back and change it, I would a million times. For this is not who I am. Never, ever did I imagine myself on the defense side of this courtroom. 
that I've spent 25 years of my life in in this county in law enforcement. As the sheriff, I gave my staff in this community all of me. Every ounce of my being. You are aware, Your Honor, that this has affected my mental health as well as my physical well-being. There's nothing left for me to get or to take from me other than my freedom. I have and I now pray that the court will find mercy on me. And I beg the court, if they see fit, to grant me community control, even with the strictest sanctions that I have proven to this court in the past two and a half years that I can abide by. I am a good person who made bad decisions and choices. I can continue to be a productive citizen in this county and be in the community with the love that I have for my family, my friends, and my neighbors. I'm asking all this so that I have the opportunity to watch my son graduate from high school and attend college this year. My daughter is getting married in October so that I can be there for her and my wife so that I can be a husband that I haven't been in 25 years due to my career. I've just not been there. Given the opportunity, I would be able to spend the time with my mother and my father and continue to be there for them when they need me. In the last years of their lives, as I've experienced this week with my dad, when two days ago I thought that I had lost him. He's still at Riverside, isn't he? Yes, ma'am. He's not on a ventilator. He is on He's, he's on two forms of ventilation without the actual well, that's tube. that's not what the nurse said, but okay. He's on, he's got some oxygen or breathing equipment, but it's not a ventilator. Okay. I have no words for the shame that I have and that I feel and the regret that I have. Betraying and displaying the trust that I had with my staff and the community. Causing and damage to my family's good name. Again, I beg of you to impose a sense of community service with the strictest sentencing and sanctions. Your Honor, please do not send me to prison. I have wrong, but I'm not ruined. I still have a lot of good left in me. I thank you for your time. Es evidente que el señor Reeder ha cometido un delito deshonroso, y aunque el señor Reeder pide perdón, la gravedad de los delitos que ha cometido deja poco margen para la indulgencia. La única consecuencia apropiada para semejante falta, que sería aceptada por el juez, los ciudadanos y la ley, es el encarcelamiento. I have a couple of questions for you. The big question uh, I have and is on everyone's mind, I'm assuming, is why did you cut open these evidence envelopes and take the money out, and then in some cases you put it back, although you were caught because the envelopes had been unsealed uh, and sealed again improperly, and the denominations did not match what was taken at the crime scene or from those individuals, uh, I guess, why did you take the money? I took the money, and mind you, this does not excuse it, but from drug dealers that took it from parents of very poor people in this county. That money regardless of what the state and what the media has claimed in the past years of a gambling problem and that money being used for gambling was used when there was a tree planted in the name of the Shelton boy. It's at the entrance of Western High School to the left as soon as you pull in. 
Nobody could pay for that tree. Nobody offered to pay for that tree. A drug dealer did. When schools had um, cheerleading or peewee that had car washes and such, I would have our cruisers taken down there. My men and women did not make good money. So some of them would give them $2, $5. I took money from that and I provided it to those people. Now I replaced it in time. The money was not in the safe the day that they came and they did the search warrant in my office. Three days prior to that, which the state has not included, I had knowledge from my secretary, Kelly Sanders, that the security company was coming into my office and that office was going to be open to anyone. I removed those monies from that safe and I put it in the back of the F-250 that I drove. Now, the day they did the search for I'm sorry, and it would be safer in the lockbox in your car than it would be in a safe? That in an sure open office? Only you have, and a few other people have the combination? Well, ma'am, no one should have had the combination but me. And it strikes me odd that Lieutenant Burchett at the time would make a statement to the state that he'd never seen the accordion file that I provided the state. I did so only on the direction of Chief Michael Spirits, who'd worked for the state at the time, who asked me if I had a comprehensive list of all monies that was in that safe, and I did not. Due to the prior sheriff, never, when there was an officer involved shooting that involved his brother, that sheriff resigned, and I took over that office. When I swore him in as a special deputy, he left two black marks leaving that office. He never, he handed me the keys. He never did an inventory of the safe, never provided any paperwork of what was in that safe, the money in that safe, or anything. I find it odd that in their search warrant, their confidential informant tells them everything to do with my office, where the safe is, that I have members of my staff telling them that they have never seen anything like that in my safe, which would only be suspect to the fact that they had gained entry into my office and into my safe to have that information to provide to the state. I did what Chief Spirits asked me to do. I organized and made a list of every envelope and every dollar that was in that safe including the name of the defendant, the date that it was taken, and provided to the state at my attorney's office to the point that I had to lend my knife to them to open these packages so that they could be counted. My attorney was called away for court and I continued to stay in that office and assist the state in counting the money. To my knowledge, there was none of the envelopes that didn't contain the right denominations of money. Their discretion or their objective is that the money from a video that was counted appears to be different than money that was in the envelopes that they seen. Well, from the video, from the PSI, the, the video shows on different dates, officers counting out money in one instance yourself um, and coming to seven thousand dollars, for instance, and then turning it over, and there was like six hundred dollars short. And, and ma'am, your honor, I advised my attorney I would take a stipulated polygraph on the thousand dollars that I provided on that particular case that the state now has a cashier's check for a thousand dollars for state versus Carter. At that scene on Rainbow Trail Road, I was with Lieutenant Burchett. It was videotaped. It was videotaped of Mr. Carter opening a locked door. There's a videotape that exists. Opening a locked door so we could prove that that door was locked and that Mr. Carter had a key. We entered that. It was being videotaped by Lieutenant Burchett. Mr. Carter pointed out where those funds were. 
They were in some sort of little container, if I remember correctly. They were pulled from that container and counted. They were taken to the back of that same F-250 and placed in the same lot box in that F-250 where Mr. Carter got in the front passenger side of my truck with me. Lieutenant Burchett followed me in his vehicle directly to the office without stopping. We got to the office. I provided Lieutenant Burchett with the entirety of those funds. So where the thousand dollar mistake comes in, I have no idea whether it was accounting error. I have no idea, but I would agree to a stipulated polygraph. But you pled guilty. I, I did, ma'am. Yes, Your Honor. And you're asking me and I'm giving you the explanation. And I have paid the restitution. I Be understand you've given, uh, yes, you're attorney. The but the that particular case. Restitution uh, that was doing, <clears throat> doing owing uh, in excess of $4,000. $4,850, Your Honor. That's been done today. All right, I want to go back to, all right. In the PSI, the pre-sentence investigation, it indicates what you're saying here as to why you claim you use the money for various charitable community things. And then, uh, but the, the PSI officer notes that there's no documentation that you used it for those things. Right, I did not document those okay. things. Okay, now I, I want to ask you about this. All right, that's your statement, what you say you use the money for, and okay, that's on record. Um, but I do want to ask you some other things here. Okay, the majority of the acts in this indictment took place between June 2017 and July uh, of 2008. Uh, right. June uh, 2017 and September 2017. Okay. Uh, the state uh, obviously alleges in their brief that, particularly since you do not have any documentation of that you use this quote for charitable purposes, uh, they secured your bank records and credit card records and all of that. Uh, and it indicates, uh, did you lose $3,000 gambling at the Scioto Downs Racino between June 2017 and September 2017? Yes, not by myself. They have cards. And, and of course, again, Your Honor, I've pled guilty to this. But they have cards that you put in a machine. I can have a card in my name, and I can have a card in my name that my wife possesses. So I can be at one machine and she can be at the other and the money that she spends and the money that I spend, they count on the same card and calculate the money as one. Now, the state has my financial records. They will see that when we are at those casinos, and I have not been to one since and will never be at one again, that the money was taking that our debit card was put in a machine and the money was taken from our checking account. Well, obviously, I, that doesn't answer the question, where did the money in the checking account come from? But no, from, I, I, At that time, I was making the salary of the sheriff and my wife was making approximately okay. $2,500. Just, just, just asking the question here, that, that, that's all. The pay. Okay. Uh, also, I want to ask you, in late June 2017, you took a trip to Reno, Nevada for the Sheriff's Conference, and then you withdrew $2,800 in an ATM. This is in addition to the expenses related to the trip for which you were not reimbursed, reimbursed until later. Uh, are, you see where they, the state believes that some of this is due to gambling. I mean, you're talking like uh, over or almost $6,000 in a couple of months that you lost um, or, or expended on gambling. And at that point, we were making almost $11,000 a month. And okay. that, again, was from my checking account where it should show my direct deposits, my wife directs deposits and that it came from our debit cards where I retrieved that money. I don't doubt it came from your debit cards. The question is, where did the money come that went into your checking account? Uh, that's, I guess that's... That's, that's where 
that's where the media reported that I had marital problems because it came from our joint bank account. My wife made very good money at the time, and I took that money and I gambled. Okay. All right. Um, that's all the questions the court has. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. I initially want to say, um, first of all, I have sentenced a number of public officials. Every case is different. No two set of facts are the same. In deciding what I believe is an appropriate sentence, the court has looked at the purposes and principles of sentencing. I've read over the briefs submitted by the attorneys. I've read over the pre-sentence investigation. You know what? I have one more question for you. Yes, Your Honor. Here it is. Okay. Now, the thrust of some of the letters, especially from Ms. Kraft, the licensed social worker. Yes, ma'am. Who, did, who didn't start to see until March 2019, talks about the stress from all these cases, all these criminal cases, the road and murders and whatever. Did you ever tell your counselors about uh, about stealing uh, from the evidence envelopes? Yes, we discussed that. I, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of stress and sleepless nights uh, you had in terms of your post-traumatic stress syndrome or your anxiety caused by the fact that you opened up these envelopes and took money that didn't belong to you. Yes, Your Honor. I, I was being treated since 2013 for those conditions, and it progressively got worse. Well, now, it, got, I, it got worse during the time period in which these offenses occurred, and uh, in 2016, starting the investigation of uh, uh, road and homicides. But I wanted to ask you that because I, from what I can tell, uh, the social worker never mentioned anything in there as a stress factor she just focused on your police work um, and i would think as i said if you committed a your honor of thefts wouldn't that cause stress no mr bolger let him talk i didn't want him to interrupt you oh, yeah okay. I, I, go ahead. I apologize no, go ahead. i believe in the last letter that she provided she spoke of the court cases and the stress and things that i was an encountering because of that as well I'm, I'm unsure. I, I believe I provided that to my counsel. Yes, but that, that's, that's again, uh, in terms of the, the, the stress over this case, which has caused, I'm sure, untold trauma for you and your family. Uh, it's always the unintended innocent victims, the families, that actually suffer the most. En 2020, el acusado, Charles Reeder, se enfrentaba a una serie de cargos por delitos graves, entre ellos robo en el ejercicio del cargo y manipulación de pruebas. Aceptando la responsabilidad de sus delitos, Charles Reeder se declaró culpable. El 24 de marzo de 2021, en Waverly, el juez condenó a Reeder a un total de tres años de prisión, un año por los dos cargos de robo en el cargo y dos años por los dos cargos de manipulación de pruebas. Pero si usted piensa que los policías condenados por explotar su poder se detiene aquí, entonces usted debe estar en la oscuridad sobre el caso de David Oliver. Mr. Oliver, you, you did stipulate the facts in this matter. I did. The facts as they were written on paper by other officers. And I want to stay with a no contest plea, Your Honor. I'm doing it with a clear mind. Este es David Oliver, de 56 años que se convirtió en el jefe de Brimfield en 2004, acumulando un importante número de seguidores en las redes sociales a través de su página de Facebook. Sin embargo, su mandato dio un vuelco en 2015, cuando surgieron acusaciones de maltrato hacia un agente, Crystal Casterline, dentro de su departamento. Esto dio lugar a una demanda civil contra él por parte de Casterline, que posteriormente pasó a los tribunales federales. Finalmente, el caso fue desestimado en 2017 tras un acuerdo de conciliación. No obstante, Oliver se vio envuelto en otros procedimientos judiciales relacionados con su implicación en el escándalo y un intento de robo en el cargo. Mr. Oliver, I'm going to ask you some questions on the being asked yes or no. How do you consider? 
Judge, do you want to sit the podium or? Sir, I have been informed by your attorney and you understand the nature of the charges to which you're pleading, which would be count one, attempted theft in office, misdemeanor of the first degree, count two, sexual assault, misdemeanor of the first degree, unlawful restraint, misdemeanor of the third degree, and unauthorized use of property, misdemeanor of the first degree. Yes, sir. Do you understand each of the misdemeanors of the first degree may bring with them up to 180 days in jail and up to a $1,000 fine in court costs? Yes, Your Honor, I do. Do you understand the misdemeanor of the third degree may bring with it up to 60 days in jail and up to a $500 fine in court costs? Yes, Your Honor, I do understand. Sir, do you understand you do have a right to a trial in this matter, either to the court or to a jury? Yes, Your Honor, I do understand that. Are you waiving your right today, sir? Yes, ma'am. And, sir, did you sign a certain waiver right to jury trial? Yes, ma'am. And did you do so voluntarily? Yes, ma'am. Sir, do you understand you have the right to confront and cross-examine witnesses against you? I do understand that, too, Your Honor. Are you waiving that right? Yes, I am. And, sir, do you understand you have the right to subpoena witnesses to come in and testify on your behalf? Yes, ma'am, I understand that. Are you waiving that right? I am, yes. And, sir, do you understand it is the obligation of the prosecutor's office to prove your guilt beyond the possible doubt? Yes, ma'am. Are you waiving that right? Yes, ma'am. And, sir, do you understand you're not required to testify against yourself? Yes, ma'am. Are you waiving that right? Yes, ma'am. And, sir, do you understand by entering a no-contest plea with a stipulation to a finding of fact, you waive the right to appeal any issue that may have been brought up at trial? Yes, ma'am. And you are waiving that right, sir? Yes, ma'am. And, sir, you signed a written plea of guilty, or, I'm sorry, written plea of no-contest waiver rights document. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. About four or five pages long? Yes, ma'am. Did you sign this document voluntarily? Yes. Did you review this document thoroughly with Mr. Pierce? Yes, I did. Do you have any questions at all regarding anything contained within this document? No, ma'am. And, sir, you are a U.S. citizen? Yes, ma'am. Sir, I've briefly gone over your rights with you. I know Mr. Pierce has gone over your rights with you. You've gone over them. Do you have any questions regarding your constitutional rights? No, ma'am. Do you waive those rights at this time? Yes, ma'am. And, sir, to the charge in count one of attempted theft in office, misdemeanor of the first degree, how do you plead? No contest. Sir, to count two, simple assault, misdemeanor of the first degree, how do you plead? No contest. Count three, unlawful restraint, misdemeanor of the third degree, how do you plead? No contest. And count four, unauthorized use of property, and misdemeanor of the first degree, how do you plead? No contest. And you are stipulating to a finding of fact, is that correct? That's correct, Judge. We would consent to the court making a finding of fact. The court will make a finding of fact, find that the defendant is a peace, was a peace officer at the time of this incident, and based on the reading of the facts, the court will find the defendant guilty of count one, attempted theft in office, misdemeanor of the first degree. Also, the court will make a finding of guilty on count two, simple assault, misdemeanor of the first degree, based on the reading of the facts. Based on the reading of the facts, the defendant will be found guilty of count three, unlawful restraint, misdemeanor of the third degree. And count four, unauthorized use of property, misdemeanor of the first degree, the defendant will be found guilty based on the reading of the facts. At this time, the court will proceed with sentencing. Before the court sentences the defendant, I'd like to hear from the defense counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Oliver, as I think everybody in this room knows, served the township of Brimfield first as a police officer and later as a chief. He served approximately 10 years as the chief of police. As everyone knows, Brimfield is a small town that has its own small town politics. I think politics have played a role in this case. And Mr. Oliver is at a point where he has decided that it would be in his best interest and the best interest of his family to resolve these matters with no contest pleas to misdemeanor offenses. He's done that for both his sake and his family's sake. I know that there are going to be statements made in this case by, I think, Ms. Casterlein. I think as everyone is aware, there is a civil suit that is pending that Ms. Casterlein has filed against both Mr. Oliver and Brimfield Township. There will be more litigation to come, but Mr. Oliver's motivation in resolving these is to attempt to achieve some 
closure for both himself and his family. This has been an extremely rough time for them. And, and I would indicate Mr. Oliver has done a lot of good for the community. Some of that good is, is a matter of public record. Uh, some of the charity work that he's done, some of the proceeds from, from his book that was referenced. Um, there are some David Oliver supporters. I suspect that a lot of people in this room today are not here to support him. Uh, but Mr. Oliver is um, certainly uh, willing and wanting to move on with his life and his family's life. And that was the motivation for these pleas today. El abogado que representa al señor Oliver aboga en su favor presentándolo como un miembro beneficioso de la sociedad que ha contribuido positivamente tanto a la comunidad como al departamento de policía. A pesar de la audaz afirmación del abogado de que las acciones de Oliver estaban motivadas por la necesidad de salvaguardar a su familia, es importante recordar que el robo al departamento de policía no puede excusarse bajo ninguna circunstancia. Mr. Oliver, would you like to make a brief statement? <coughs> Your Honor, I was chief uh, for the Brentfield Police Department for 10 years, 10 months. There was a collective bargaining contract in place for the entire time I was there. There was never one grievance filed. Never one. This year we entered into some pretty tense, I'm sorry, in 2014 we entered into some pretty intense contract negotiations where I requested pay cuts from the officers due to a 12% increase in insurance. The officers refused to take that, that cut and, and negotiations got pretty tense. Nothing was said about any of this. Some of this information dates back to 2012. I mean, I, I, one question, and I'm not going to be long, Your Honor, but one question I would ask is if there was a sworn police officer who thought there was a crime that had been committed in 2012, why didn't he report it? The secondary thing about this is I never heard anything about a hostile work environment or assault or I will guarantee you that Crystal punched me as, as much as I punched her. That's, that's the relationship we had. Her children spent the night with me and my family numerous times, all the way up to September 2014. Then we had the layoff notices came out that she was on the list, and as soon as we worked out the contract and rescinded the layoff notices, two days later, I got the hostile work environment charge and a threat from the union for a no confidence vote. There is no way in the world that I could have brought this case to a jury with three or four police officers, what they were going to testify and run the risk with the jury. I, I just couldn't do it. So this whole thing befuddles me. I, I've never seen anything like it. There are officers here today who used to work for me show, that, that have shown up just to grind it. One that I fired, well, I mean, When you are the boss, you don't make a lot of friends. So, Mr. Oliver, you you did stipulate to the facts in this matter. I did. The facts as they were written on paper by other officers. And I want to stay with a no contest plea, Your Honor. I'm doing it with a clear mind. Anything else, Mr. Pierce, you'd like to say on behalf of the defendant? No, Your Honor. Thank you. I was thinking this morning about um, how I was involved in Shop with the Cops in Brimfield, and you were the head of that program, and the little children were so happy. They loved doing the Shop with the Cops and loved going to Applebee's. Now, I, I'm thinking now how you let those little children down. You let the people of Brimfield down. You let your family down. You let law enforcement down. You become the milk that you wrote about in your book. Do you realize that? I'm going to take the recommendations of the uh, Assistant Attorney General in sentencing the defendant with uh, a proviso of probation, uh, just based on what 
she felt was appropriate and what uh, the, the attorneys agreed to. I hope this never happens again to anyone else. I hope no one else comes forward. That would be a huge letdown to everyone in law enforcement. On the attempted theft in office, misdemeanor of the first degree, I'm going to sentence the defendant to 180 days in Portage County Jail. On the simple assault misdemeanor of the first degree, I'm going to sentence the defendant to 180 days in Portage County Jail. On the unlawful restraint misdemeanor of the third degree, I am going to sentence the defendant to 60 days in Portage County Jail. On the unauthorized use of property misdemeanor of the first degree, I am going to sentence the defendant to 180 days in jail. Those sentences will run concurrent to one another. I am also going to assess the defendant a $1,000 fine and court costs. I will suspend the balance of the jail and $700 of the fine on the following conditions. First, you will be placed on basic probation here in Portage County for a period of 24 months. Second, you will pay your court costs and fines within 24 months. If you cannot pay, I will allow you to do community work service of up to 40 hours a week at $10 per hour until paid in full. Your court costs are currently $121, so to work this off, you have to do around 42 community work service hours. You will pay restitution of $1,304 in 24 months through the Adult Probation Department here in Portage County to the victim, Brimfield Police Department. You will be persona non grata at the Brimfield Police Department and you will have absolutely no contact whatsoever, directly or indirectly, with the victim in this matter. Lastly, you will sur surrender your OPADA certificate under section 109.77 of the Ohio Revised Code. It's my understanding at this time you don't have the physical uh, certificate, but you are surrendering uh, your right to be a police peace officer in the state of Ohio. Do you understand that, sir? Yes, ma'am. So if you violate any of these terms or conditions, I will impose the original jail sentence on each count to run consecutive to one another. Do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. Anything else at this time, Mr. Pierce? No, Your Honor, thank you. Anything else, Mr. Long? Not from the state, thank you. You'll need to go over to the adult probation program today and sign up with the probation department. Thank you. Thank you. David Oliver negó repetidamente con la cabeza, hizo largas pausas y se mostró claramente dubitativo antes de declararse finalmente inocente de cuatro de los delitos menores que se le imputaban, dos de ellos relacionados con el maltrato a la agente. La juez del condado de Portage, Lori Pittman lo condenó a dos años de libertad condicional y ordenó la suspensión de su certificación como agente de la ley, lo que le impide volver a trabajar como policía en Ohio. Pero la corrupción, los delitos menores y el abuso de autoridad por parte de la policía no acaban aquí. A continuación, el horrendo caso de Daniel Saylor. I've served my country in the state of Florida for many years, and I find myself in this position now. I don't know what to say, Your Honor, please have mercy on me. Este es Daniel Saylor, de 58 años, ex jefe de policía de Windermere, que fue detenido por primera vez en enero de 2011 por encubrir el caso de violación de su amigo, el señor Bush. Daniel Saylor se declaró inocente de mala conducta oficial y estuvo menos de un año en la cárcel. Sin embargo, poco después Saylor fue acusado de perjurio por presuntamente proporcionar falso testimonio durante el juicio de su amigo Bush en enero de 2011. I want to thank you again for your time and consideration of this case. I also wish to tell you some special privileges enjoyed by jurors. No juror can ever be required to talk about what happened in the jury room except by court order. For many years, we have relied upon jurors for consideration of difficult cases. Therefore, this law gives you this unique privilege not to talk about your votes, your discussions, your deliberations for as long as you wish it. You're now free to speak with anyone you'd like about this case. You're also free to refuse to speak with anyone. It's completely up to you individually. With that, you can follow the deputy out. Uh, Any legal reason we cannot proceed to sentence? 
take are you at the central thing? I do have a score sheet if I could approach her on. You may. Defense, do you wish to handle the VOP at the same time? Yes, sure. No. CF11518. Mr. Staler, you're still under oath. Is it true that you were in fact on probation for four counts? Official misconduct, official misconduct, solicitation for official misconduct and tampering with evidence. Is that true? Yes, ma'am. Yes, were, ma were you in fact placed on probation on June 30th, 2012? Yes, ma'am. Finding that, I will find that your admission is on, on that particular issue and find that there is a violation as to violation of condition five. And there are just for record purposes, the purpose of the violation of probation, we would object to the same evidentiary issues that we did in the trial. I understand, thank you. State argument? Yes, Your Honor. The defendant has been found guilty of perjury. I know Your Honor heard the testimony over the course of the last day and a half. Uh, the state believes that one of statutory aggravators, the factual aggravators in this case, are the nature of the proceeding, not only the fact that it was designated by the legislature as a capital case, but that there were two young victims involved uh, who did testify. And as I stated in closing arguments, uh, I don't believe there's any other way to read Mr. Sager's testimony other than it was designed to impact their credibility before the jury. Thankfully, the jury found Mr. Bush guilty in that case. Uh, to compound that, you have the fact that he was in law enforcement for many years. And as he admitted on the stand, he was very aware of his duty and oath to tell the truth, not only as a law enforcement officer, but especially when testifying before this court. Uh, and finally, as Your Honor just noted, for the record, he was on probation to boot when he uh, made these statements. So I will leave it by saying that Your Honor knows that every day we do criminal cases in this courthouse. And if people do not tell the truth, then the system of justice we have will not work. It's impossible. Mr. Sager knew that, and regardless of that fact, in all his years of experience, he got on the stand and told a lie. Uh, I'm not going to make a formal recommendation as to the years. Your Honor has a score sheet in front of you. You know what he scores. Um, the state would just ask that Your Honor weigh the testimony and evidence in this case and render an appropriate sentence. Thank you. Keep that for argument. Your Honor, I don't really know what to say to you. I still believe what I said was the truth. I'm a single father with a daughter. I've served my country in the state of Florida for many years, and I find myself in this position now. I don't know what to say to you, Your Honor. Please have mercy on me. Your Honor, just briefly, um, I have reviewed the score sheet and have no additional information or corrections to make to it. I always think it's difficult, Your Honor, when there are witnesses who testify in court and cases like this would seem to stifle certain witnesses from testifying in cases because of the ramifications of that testimony. The court will call the evidence from the Bush case in 2003, which was the basis of the statement. There was no evidence that Natasha Bush had ever made any sort of allegation of a sexual abuse. That didn't occur in 2009. I believe the state's position that somehow this affected whatever the outcome of the case in regards to Natasha Bush is isn't true based on the fact that there was no such evidence back in 2003. I understand that Mr. Sarah was convicted here today. We would ask the court to follow the guidelines in sentencing Mr. Saylor and give him a concurrent sentence on violation of probation. CF13-3900, the court will adjudicate you guilty as the jury found you to be guilty. Sentence you to eight years Department of Corrections credit for 13 days that you served. And CF11518A as to the four counts, the court will will uh, adjudicate you guilty, will revoke and terminate your probation. And each of those counts will sentence you to a four-year Department of Corrections sentence. Each count to run concurrently, in each case to run concurrently. That's credit for, excuse me, 15 days that you served.
Because all the statutory court cost fees, cost of prosecution, those amounts of money will be sent to collections court for you to start making payments within 180 days of your release from custody. No less than $30 a month until it's paid off. You have 30 days in which to appeal the judgment and sentence. If you cannot afford an attorney, an attorney will be appointed to represent you. Then the appeal has to be in writing in those 30 days. Do you understand that, sir? I don't understand how many years I've got, Your Honor. Eight years total. It's four years concurrent on the violation of probation. Your Honor, as for the credit for time served the violation of probation, it's my understanding that he had served a year in jail in that matter. Is that your understanding today? Yes, I believe the sentence was 52 weeks, 51 weeks work release is my understanding. And that should be 51 weeks and 15 days. That's not shown. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good luck to you, sir. Un jurado del condado de Orange, constituido para el caso del señor Saylor, tardó un tiempo considerable, una hora y quince minutos para ser exactos, antes de llegar a un veredicto. La naturaleza de su delito dejaba poco lugar a dudas, exigiendo un veredicto que sirviera de firme ejemplo. El señor Saylor fue condenado a ocho años de prisión y fue escoltado a la cárcel del condado de Orange para cumplir su condena. Pero si usted piensa que es el final de estos casos horrendos, entonces usted está en para una sorpresa con el caso del jefe de policía, Scott Gardner. As soon as I found out what was happening, and the state makes the allegation of, of why well, I did it after the subpoena. Well, I didn't know there was anything wrong or going, going on until I received the subpoena. Se trata de Scott Gardner, de 49 años, ex jefe de policía de East Cleveland, que fue acusado en agosto de 2022 de varios cargos, entre ellos robo en el cargo, fraude en las telecomunicaciones y manipulación de pruebas. En el verano de 2023, fue acusado de nuevo y los fiscales añadieron cargos relacionados con la presentación de declaraciones de impuestos fraudulentas, blanqueo de dinero y nuevos delitos de robo. Mr. Gardner is sorry for what happened. He absolutely is remorseful. This has been very, very difficult for him. He has asked me on a number of occasions, what am I going to do? I have to make sure that this never happens again. Like I, I you know, it worries him. He, d he doesn't want... He doesn't want to engage in this sort of behavior. He doesn't want to be seen as somebody who would steal from the state of Ohio. Mr. Gardner is a person that cares about others. I can say that from my personal experiences with him. I can say that from the way I see him interact with others. He is a very kind man. He is generous. He would help anybody with anything. He really would. It's just his nature. I know I had said it before, but just as generous as, as Mr. Gardner is with others in He would pay for things for others. You saw that in the letters. He would buy other people things if they needed them. He put his own money into the department. He put his own money into the FOP. And maybe, maybe some of the money was that. But Mr. Gardner is, not only did he do those things, but he is trying to pay that back. And he's paid a significant portion of that back. And he will continue to make payments on that. He is dedicated to doing that. He's dedicated to taking care of his responsibilities. And he cares about other people. Him attempting to be a cheat or a thief or anything of that nature is not his intentions. It's, it's really not. Mr. Gardner is a caring person and I think that he is going to now tell you how he got into this situation and he would like to apologize to the court and the state of Ohio. <clears throat> Your Honor, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been two years since I've been able to talk about this um, and, and I greatly do apologize. I apologize. First off, for wasting the court's time, wasting the state of Ohio's time. Um, it, it was never my intention to have this underreported. And as, as Ms. Hibbert uh, expressed, as soon as I found out what was happening, and the state makes the allegation of, of why well, I, I did it after the subpoena. Well, I didn't know there was anything wrong or going, going on until I received the subpoena. Uh, I immediately took action. I, I fully acknowledge that that money is not my money. The money was accepted uh, as I've learned that I should not have accepted or kept. Um, so I, I fully acknowledge that and I fully prepare, uh, you know, since that time I've, I've had certified public accountants uh, filing my sales tax. Uh, 
with the interim of my CPA actually firing me because of this incident uh, recently, but uh, my, my intention is to make certain that this does not occur again. Um, this is not who I am. This is not what I want my, my perception to be uh, for the remaining time. And I, I appreciate the, the time, Your Honor, for me to be able to speak. I want to be real clear, Mr. Gardner, because I don't want you to have any um, false impression about uh, the impression that you've made on me. This isn't just reckless on your part. I don't believe that for one minute. Not for one second do I believe that you're just a poor bookkeeper. We're talking about a factor of over 10. You, you paid 1,000 when you were supposed to pay 12,000. You paid 3,000 when you were supposed to pay 49,000. That's not an oops. That's not a, I, I just am a sloppy bookkeeper. That's a person who essentially was, and maybe Ms. Ms. Uh, Hibbert is right when she said that, says that you did good things with some of that money, but you were essentially robbing from Peter to pay Paul. And, and I, I don't buy the argument that it was just an oversight. And as soon as it was brought to your attention, you said, oh my gosh, let me correct this. Um, I believe you believe that you could just do this, get away with it, nobody would notice. Um, but for the phenomenal investigative work done by the agents um, who testified in this case, I think you never would have paid this money. Um, so I don't buy that argument. I don't buy the sloppy bookkeeper argument um, it just, it doesn't fly. I, I listen to the testimony. Sometimes when cases aren't tried, as judges, it becomes difficult to assess what really happened because you, you don't get to really hear uh, the facts of the case uh, as much as you do when there's a trial. But here, it, it was abundantly clear that you were, you just were kind of running a scam. I mean, we're not going to get too deep into it because a lot of the counts were dismissed against you. But there was an awful lot of testimony that I heard uh, that, that signaled a, a guy who was willing to cut corners. Um, that's who you are. I mean, let's not kid ourselves, right? This is your third time in the courtroom, or is it fourth? Third or fourth time? Third, Your Honor. All right, so we, we have two separate instances where you've been charged with this sort of behavior, right? The first time it happens, you might say, oh my God, here I am, a police officer. I've been charged in Portage County for misconduct revolving around um, a cigar shop I own. You might say, well, you know, I'm a fine police officer, but I'm a bad cigar shop owner, operator. Um, I've got to do better. Then you get another case, and you say, oh my god, I can't believe this happened again. I I I've got to do better. Now, a third time, and we're supposed to write that off as just another oops? That's, that's nonsense. I don't buy it, not for one minute. That's not to suggest that Ms. Hibbert is wrong when she says that there's good in you. I'm certain that it's true. Um, but, but you were stealing. To come in here and say something else um, is somewhat offensive. Um, in the end, though, what you pled guilty to was a single fourth degree felony with a presumption in favor of community control. And as judges, we're not just throwing darts at a spinning board and hoping that we hit the right sentence. We use the guidance that we're given. And this is a nonviolent offense. You have no felony criminal history. So this is your first felony conviction. Um, I don't see that as a small matter. Um, I see, particularly someone who's spent their career in law enforcement, uh, having to carry around uh, a felony conviction as a significant thing. Um, so although I'm, I'm in no way fooled by your story of the hapless business owner who just can't shoot straight, I I'm not going to overreact um, and incarcerate you today. Uh, I don't believe that police officers, um, when they commit crimes that are really unrelated to their business, ought to be treated more harshly than, say, a, a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. You know, the fact of the matter is, um, I, I, I'm going to sentence you like I would anyone else charged with a low-level, nonviolent felony of the fourth degree who has no prior felony criminal history. 
So although I certainly appreciate why the government might be inclined to ask for prison here, I think it would be an overreaction. I think it's unfair to people who have committed their lives to law enforcement, which is a real honor to be able to say that my job is to protect and serve the community. Uh, I mean, that's a real honor. But I don't think that the payback for having committed yourself to a life in law enforcement is for judges to immediately send you to prison and apply some sort of police officer specification. That means whenever a police officer commits a crime, they have to go to prison when another person wouldn't. I don't think that's appropriate. Um, so I'm not going to incarcerate you even in the face of your foolish explanation as to why you did this. You need to take some time while you're on probation um, and, and, and do some soul searching and figure out what your life plan is going to be. Because cutting corners and running raggedy businesses where you steal from the state hasn't worked for you. You're now a convicted felon. Here's where it gets a little bit more interesting. Now that you are a convicted felon, and you're about to be on probation to me for the next five years, if I even get a whiff, a sniff, that you're cutting corners out there in the world, that you're running some kind of a business and maybe not doing the things that you're supposed to do, that maybe you've put a business in someone else's name and you're teaching them how to cut these corners, if I find out about it, you're going to prison. Do you understand me? Yes, Your Honor. Is there anything unclear about that? No, Your Honor. You're going to have to pay this restitution. You will be responsible for, what is it, $149,000? $149, $149,954.50. Um, that restitution will be a condition of your community control. If I sent you to prison, it would make it more difficult for you to repay that debt. Um, so that's one of the other benefits of you being able to be in the community. And in addition to that, um, you know, it's also not lost on me that, that you tarnish the badge when you do this. Now, you didn't do it relative to your work as a police officer, right? This wasn't something that, that, that you used your role as a police officer um, to sort of get away with the crime. Um, but look, let's, let's be clear. The reason why all these cameras are pointed at you is because you're a police officer, not just a police officer, but chief of police who has fallen this far. It stains the badge. It blemishes the badge. You're going, you're going to have a consequence that's tangible, not just the intangible um, consequence of a felony conviction. Uh, you're going to give back to the community. Uh, this went on for many years. Um, going back to 2014, uh, our window is a, is a six-year window. Um, so with that in mind, you're going to do 600 hours of community service. 100 hours for every year that you engaged in this scam. And that's what it was. It was a scam. I don't, again, I don't be repetitive, but the sloppy bookkeeper story is not believable for a guy that's been in court on two separate occasions for similar conduct. So for each year you engaged in, in this um, scam, you'll do 100 hours of community service. Uh, I would certainly, um, I, I would never, over any point in that five years you're on probation to me, I'd never forget that I, I, I'm giving you a chance, that your judge gave you a chance, right? But that's all it is. If it turns out that Ms. Soul and, and the state of Ohio is right, and you just don't have it in you to do good, then you'll make a mistake over these five years, and you'll end up going to prison. On the other hand, I hope that just like me, uh, on some level, the state of Ohio is rooting for you to do well, right? The goal of this is to see people not recidivize. The goal of this is to correct behavior. And there ought to be punishment. The punishment is the 600 hours of community service. But, but the hope is that over the course of the next five years, um, you, even if it's only out of fear, um, the state of Ohio won't have to worry about you stealing from the state anymore. Uh, because of that, that heightened anxiety that your, your freedom is at stake. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Uh, normally, it's the court's inclination uh, to, to create incentives uh, for people to do well on community control. Uh, and so I, I always look for ways to consider terminating community control early. So I would commonly put people on maybe five years of community control, but I'll say, look, if you can show me a year of sobriety, 
um, 12 straight months, we'll terminate your probation. But I want you to understand, I'm not going to do that in this case. I want there to be some certainty that you're being supervised for as long a period of time as I possibly can. So that's the, that's the uh, maybe the one dissimilarity to the way I'm treating you and I might someone else. Uh, I want you to be supervised for as long as the law allows me to do it. And that's the five years. Uh, so while you're on uh, community control, you'll report monthly, uh, you'll be drug tested, uh, you will have to maintain verifiable employment. Uh, you, are, uh, you are on a habitual offenders list, so you can't um, operate a business in the state of Ohio. You'll have to have some sort of verifiable employment. Um, I'll, I'll give you some flexibility there because I understand that you are retired, but, but there's going to have to be some work. Uh, you'll have to show that you're doing some work in addition to just the community service. Um, as I indicated, you will be drug tested. Uh, I don't know if there's a drug issue here. Maybe there's not. Um, None whatsoever, Your Honor. That's, that's fine. I'm happy to hear that. Um, but, but on the off chance that there should come a time uh, where you test positive for a, 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 an illegal substance, I want you to understand I'm not going to incarcerate you for that. Uh, we'll just we'll talk more, and we'll figure out a way to help you if there is a drug issue that that uh, that, that should arise. Um, and, and to that uh, to that end, I, I want you to be forthcoming with our probation department. If there are issues that you have that maybe haven't been addressed in open court, uh, maybe they're too private uh, to discuss in open court. Discuss them with you probation officer, develop a relationship with the probation officer so that you can speak with that person. We have a fantastic probation department. Um, bless you. Um, I, I, I certainly hope that you're able to pay this money back. Um, I don't want you to think that just because um, maybe on some level um, I've had some harsh words for you, Mr. Gardner, um, that, that I want to see you do poorly. Uh, to the contrary, my hope is that this sentence uh, will have the net effect of you doing well and extricating yourself from the system and never having to, uh, to, to go through this again. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Sowell, anything else on behalf of the state? No, Your Honor. We would just ask the journal entry to reflect the restitution amount. It will be in the journal entry. Thank you. Ms. Hebert? Nothing. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Return. <clears throat> All rise. En marzo de 2024, el señor Gardner se declaró culpable de uno de los cargos relacionados con impuestos en un acuerdo de culpabilidad que retiró los otros 23 cargos en su contra. Entre 2014 y 2019, Gardner no pagó más de 203 mil dólares en impuestos estatales sobre las ventas de su negocio de seguridad privada. Según la fiscal adjunta del condado de Cuyahoga, Samantha Soule, Gardner fue puesto en libertad condicional por no pagar impuestos en otros dos casos en 2014, al mismo tiempo que comenzó a no pagar sus impuestos en este caso. Considerando todas las ofensas, el señor Gardner fue sentenciado a cinco años de libertad condicional y 600 horas de servicio comunitario por el cargo de impuestos. Resulta asombroso ver a policías cometer delitos tan atroces, pero al menos algunos de ellos aparecen ante las cámaras recibiendo su merecido castigo. Si te ha gustado este video, asegúrate de dejar un like y suscribirte. Hasta la próxima.